Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Conversations with Tyler. Tonight, I'm chatting with the amazing Audrey Tang, who is also Digital Minister of Taiwan. Audrey, welcome. Hello. Good local time, everyone. What software that doesn't exist yet would be most helpful for coordinating future anti-authoritarian movements? Well, of course, a quantum-resistant um, cryptographic channel uh, will really help that enable true, secure conversation that once it's someone uh, try to intercept it, you will know uh, immediately. There are encrypted channels now, such as WhatsApp. Do they not serve that function? If the makers of the software decide to uh, eavesdrop uh, themselves, uh, then there's no physical property, uh, only mathematical property. Um, that stops uh, the conversation being eavesdropped. Now, those, um, what we call the public key cryptography mathematics, is at a uh, very real danger of being broken within a decade or so, or two decades if you're optimistic, by the quantum computer themselves. What kind of software do we need to make the democracy of the future work? Well, first of all, I think democracy is a ongoing process. So definitely uh, something that makes the listening at scale work, uh, that makes co-presence work, that enables people who are closest to the suffering amplify their experiences and so that people with various different backgrounds can empathize with that experience. So in short, software that enables listening and feeling at scale. And does virtual reality help in that regard, or does virtual reality give us experiences so intense that we become less empathetic to suffering? Because that VR vacation in Paris is just so amazing. That's right. So uh, only if it's shared reality, though. Um, I hear you uh, talking about your amazing VR Paris vacation, but unless I can answer the same space uh, and make it an extended reality that contains both of us, it would not become a social reality and just an individual reality. And that may, of course, have some therapeutic uh, effects uh, or overview effect. I'm not denying that, uh, but I would say that this is pro-social but not necessarily democratic. Do you think at the margin, people with virtual reality will be more interested in visiting the slums of Mumbai or going to Sun Moon Lake in Taiwan, which is very beautiful, of course? Well, why not do both? I mean, uh, you can definitely take the uh, Sun and Moon Lake uh, and just in the Sun and Moon Lake uh, have a conversation uh, and watch together uh, how it works uh, in Mumbai and vice versa. I mean, we just had a Asia Pacific Social Innovation Partnership Award and in the summit we hear the designers in Singapore working uh, for a app that enabled the foreign workers, the offshore workers um, from Philippines uh, in, say, Taiwan uh, to uh, take care of their loved ones and instead of sending cash home. They can do grocery shopping to make sure that their money is not made, uh, spent on luxury goods and so on. So that's like three different countries and cultures right there. Let's say we had a service, a better version of AI, and anyone in the world could ask it any question in any language. It would mostly give pretty good answers. Would that increase empathy or lower it? Well, of course, that um, depends on what you mean by pretty good. Does it make satisfying sounding answers? Does it make answers that seems uh, real? Does it make mostly factual but not empathetic answers? Uh, does it make mostly empathetic but factually untrue answers? What does good enough mean to you? Say it's mostly factual answers. It's as good as a computer chess program. Not perfect but quite good relative to human knowledge. And anyone can ask anything, like a supercharged Google plus a, a better functioning Siri with real answers. Okay. What do we do with uh, that knowledge? Well, first of all, uh, that that's the value alignment part. What you're saying is that it more or less agree with the um, epistemic norms, that is to say the norm around knowledge that a society has. Uh, the other part to ask is about the accountability, like when it makes mistakes, who get to correct those mistakes? When it's biased, who get to participate in overcoming the bias? Is the source code, is the API, is the data that it uses uh, participatory, or it is known to only a few? What's the innovation that would do the most to boost empathy? Um, definitely open innovation. That is to say, innovation that is co-created to bring technology to people rather than asking people to adapt to technology. 
Do you think the United States today has more empathy than 20 years ago? Uh, I'm not sure that the states is a useful abstraction when you talk about empathy. Empathy are between human beings or at least animals. Do we have more empathy toward animals than 100 years ago? There's much more factory farming, right? There is much more factory farming. That's exactly right. Uh, on the other hand, of course, people understand uh, how animals suffer more. And so that leads to more uh, people understanding the animal welfare and animal right angles. It also leads to innovations um, such as um, the um, Impossible Burger, uh, the future of meat uh, and things like that. Maybe people eat it only because it actually tastes better and uh, is free of the possible um, industrial farming side effects. Uh, specifically on carbon emissions, uh, but uh, whatever reason uh, you uh, approach those new kind of meat, uh, I think they are superior in almost every regard uh, than cost. Uh, and that part, uh, the science are working on it too. What's your view of that old, I think, Stalin quotation, that one death is a tragedy, a million deaths are a statistic? Could it be mm -hmm. that the evolution of open source technology, it directs our attention toward the whole, and the telling of a single story becomes somewhat diminished, and therefore we're less empathetic. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, that uh, between one and one million, there's many, many zooming levels. I mean, if you look at a open street map, but you can only zoom to the globe or zoom to an individual block uh, in a city or even just to an individual level, then that map is not very useful at all. What's useful is in the transitional zoom levels that uh, make sure that people can build a context in their head and connect their experiences with people who are slightly different, but not at all that different. And that builds common values so that a transition between the zooming levels is much more important at the one and a million level. Would it be better if smartphones did not have touch screens? Uh, I use, of course, stylus um, like all the time. Uh, and so uh, the touch screens are useful when I don't have the stylus and keyboard handsy uh, as a kind of fallback. Uh, but if uh, the touch screen is the primary interaction bu uh, button, then of course it builds addiction. But say we could magically revert to the days of BlackBerry and somehow that would stick. Would society be better off, do you think? I'm sure that people would still invent a touchscreen. But say we could avoid the touchscreen, right? And we just stop at BlackBerry. Do we but, use but social why? media in better ways? But why? Do we, do we jump to Neuralink directly from the BlackBerry then? It would take several decades at least, right? So we have 30, 40 years of BlackBerry and people are mm -hmm. on social media less. Is mm -hmm. that a better outcome? Do we have better discourse, more empathy? Mm -hmm. Well, um, that may be uh, the case because in Taiwan, the uh, most popular Reddit equivalent is the PTT and it's still terminal based. It's like a uh, late 90s uh, version of the bulletin board system. And we do see that it leads to better discourse uh, qualities. How bullish are you on work from a distance? This is pandemic time. There's a lot of data. What do you think? Well, working from a distance does not mean that you don't meet people face to face. It only means that we transcend space boundaries when we're talking to each other. And so if it is something that you can opt in to, then of course there are places and ways of work uh, that improve the work quality. And I'm quite bullish on that. But if it's a must and you have to uh, work from a distance, even for the kind of work that doesn't quite suit this working from distance, then of course it's going to hurt the quality of work. But take the major tech companies, Apple, where you've worked, Facebook, Google. So if seven years from now, when the pandemic is clearly over, say in the United States, how much of the current work from distance practices will persist? Or do you think it would all just have gone back to how it was in 2019? I've never been to Cupertino, so all my work with Apple for six years were telework, so I'm biased. Uh, I, I think it's um, pretty smooth, uh, and if we don't like the tools that we're using for telework, we just make the tools better. And and that's the, the main idea about open innovation, in that if people don't like the particular way that a tool is limiting our imaginations, they can always improve on it. Um, so, yeah, I think, um, again, this is not about excluding uh, people from participating in the work. It's about expanding the idea of face-to-face -face meetings and the kind of empathy and rough consensus that we can form and scale it to the more remote places. It's a um, not a replacement, it is an augmentation uh, to the face-to-face -face form. How should the United States handle the regulation of major Chinese tech companies, the service TikTok, or say the service of WeChat? Should we Maybe. allow major Chinese tech companies to own them? 
Well, take a systemic risk uh, assessment approach. Uh, do what the Taiwanese people did in 2014, uh, which is people on the street deliberated uh, with their own experience working with um, people who are from the PRC, uh, coming to a consensus on the street that there's no pure private sector companies in the PRC, and the uh, party or the state, really the same thing, uh, can just replace and swap leadership as they like through the party branches. So we decided eventually that making the infrastructure components in the PRC while their state subsidy uh, looks quite lucrative uh, amortize is actually a higher overall cost of ownership because you have to reassess for each upgrade whether the state have already taken over that so-called private vendor. So the US government should block TikTok or make sure it's sold to Oracle or Microsoft or what, what concretely would that mean? I'm saying that I'm saying that uh, a all of society deliberation, the style of the 2014 sunflower, need to happen for the society had come to a common value about these sort of things. And this is what we call data norm. Do you think it is normal uh, for facial recognitions and s- such data that you uh, are just you know filming yourself as uh, singing and dancing uh, to be aggregated uh, to a single state and of which there is no jurisdictional accountability of using such data? If you think it's great uh, as a country, um, well, more powers. Uh, but if you think it's not great as a country, then maybe you collectively can find something to do. Given your position on democracy, are you concerned about the de facto extraterritoriality of European privacy regulation? That web Sorry, services, uh, mar- web I, services yeah. marketing to the EU uh-huh. have to meet GDPR, say. So uh-huh. there's not an actual democratic deliberation, but it's handed down uh-huh. by the European Union. Right. Uh, yeah, theoretically, it's even extraterrestrial, right? So if there's sure. Euro- European astronauts yes. and so on, they're still regulated by the GDPR. Um, so I think there's two things going on here. One is about the data norm, uh, and uh, for the EU citizens, it extends uh, by the framework of human right, and therefore, of course, travels uh, with the individual, not within the territorial jurisdiction. And the other uh, view, of course, is based on the infrastructure, uh, where the data is collected, where the data is used, uh, under the name of data localization and uh, even sovereignty. Um, we have heard that word too uh, when used uh, on data borders. And so just like the example I mentioned of the Singaporean app uh, with Filipino workers in Taiwan uh, buying grocery for their um, families, uh, it's by its very nature three different overlapping jurisdictions and all have a governing interest in it. Um, and so it's a reality and GDPR is part of that reality. Why is Finnegan's Wake your favorite book? Uh, well, because it's very complex and complicated, and I can enjoy it without understanding it, just treating it as lyrics, like a notebook, literally a book of notes. Has it influenced your approach to tech at all? Uh, yeah, I think so, uh, because uh, when I was 20 years old, I would wake up, log into the Pearl uh, IRC channel, that's Internet Relay Chat, and type River Run, and then um, a bot uh, will uh, just paste a random paragraph, literally a random paragraph, from Finnegan's Wake, which would begin um, my day's work. Uh, and so that's social, too. Everybody in the chat channel sees it. Uh, and so I, I'm sure that it has influenced uh, our work on Pearl, which is full with haiku and poetry and things like that. Have you written poems in Pearl? Uh, yeah, of course. Are they good? Uh, I don't know. You can check the pugs.hs uh, repository to see them. Now, your ideal of radical transparency in communications, do you think this is appropriate for all organizations and personality types or just something that's good for you? What's a personality type at all? People who are very like balanced folks? and moderate. I think uh-huh. can do better with radical transparency. People uh-huh. who say might have very high levels of testosterone. Uh-huh. If they see and hear everything being said about them, they, they uh-huh. might go into a rage or overreact, uh-huh. right? Well, going into a rage may also be cathartic. It might be, but rages can be dangerous, right? Countries going into a rage, people going into a rage. 
I don't know, because outreach is the beginning of social movement. The, the thing is, where do you direct the outreach to? If it's directed to revenge, that is to say hurting uh, imaginary or real people, uh, or if it's uh, directed to, I don't know, um, discrimination, uh, which is lowering other people's social status without elevating one's own, uh, of course, those could be destructive, as you said, but it could also be directed into co-creation, that is to say make new institutions so that the old problems that provoke the rage in the first place do not happen again. And that's how democracy grows. Uh, and so I'm, I'm all for outrage, actually. What do you think of creative ambiguity of a way of postponing disputes? So the European Union often does this. They write a complicated document. It means something a bit different to each country. They don't agree. Uh, they don't have to agree. It's never radically transparent, but they revisit it seven or eight years later and do another tweak and just keep on moving down that road. Does that offend your sense of radical transparency? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, these two are certainly orthogonal. I mean, I can imagine being radically transparent, but deliberately moving in a very slow fashion and only act on the lowest of the lower hanging fruits. I can see merits in that too. Uh, I can also see, of course, this slow moving part uh, being non uh, radically transparent. And then the main um, repercussion would probably be that people cease to feel that it's relevant to their lives and will not devote their energy to it. Given your own radical transparency, do you think people speak to you differently, always being aware that it's being recorded or transcribed? Or do you think they just forget about it and become their normal selves? Well, I think uh, the better parts of themselves are shown much more visibly. That is to say, if they have an agenda that benefits um the humankind or the planet or the cosmos, they're much more likely to share it because it's also performative. They understand that people from the future will see it. Uh, but uh, the parts of themselves that think for the next quarter only of linear uh, individual growth or GDP growth at a cost or expense of future generations, that part doesn't seem to show. Now, Larry Wall once said that Pearl is designed around laziness, hubris, and impatience. That's right. Which of those qualities do you think most appealed to you? Uh, laziness. Why? You don't seem uh, lazy. You, you've done a tremendous amount. Uh-huh. Well, uh, first of all, um, I've done a tremendous amount precisely because I designed the spaces for the uh, people who care about things to make things happen. So certainly not me personally that have done those things. I just hold the space. And the second is that laziness also means that you do not um, over scare yourself, right? You, you evaluate. This is called lazy evaluation. Evaluate the parameters, the input and so on as the situation causes it. Uh, and so that also enables a much more balanced work-life balance, I guess. What is a way the world could use the incentive of fun more productively? Uh, so use humor over rumor. What does that mean specifically? In Taiwan, whenever there's a uh, trending uh, on even end-to-end -end encrypted channels uh, disinformation campaign, um, the people who voluntarily report that, uh, just like flagging email as spam, uh, dedicated not to the government, certainly, but to the social sector with a crowdsourced fact-checking mechanism called COVID Facts, and also the uh, Taiwan Fact Check Center, Michael Penn, and so on, part of the international fact-checking network. And so the trending rumors are met with fact-checking almost immediately and our ministries uh, who has teams of participation officers who talk to hashtags um, like the Minister of Health and Welfare participation officer literally lives with this dog uh, and so can meet the rumors uh, within a couple hours and roll out very funny dog memes um, that just respond to the disinformation and so uh, for example this one is about mask uh, and this says why do you wear a mask well to protect yourself from your own and wash hands say that that's a very individualistic uh, incentive. Or why do you observe social distancing but you find it hard to measure? We're measured in terms of dogs. When you're outdoor, um, two dogs away, uh, indoor, three sheep are eaten away, and so on. The idea is that uh, before people go to sleep, uh, even if they see both the conspiracy theory, they also see this uh, humor because the travels very quickly go viral. Um, and so by the time that they go to sleep and form long-term associations uh, in their minds uh, with the keywords such such as mods or social distancing, they think of something fun, and that enable more pro-social behavior. Arguably, contemporary Taiwanese culture is really quite gentle in a nice way. But say you were in one of the less liberal parts of Eastern Europe or the Balkans, and the slogan was humor over rumor. 
Do you think it would work as well as it has in Taiwan? Well, we know it would be nastier and less empathetic. Sure. We know that humor uh, is not the same um, as sarcasm, for example, or as, you know, uh, toxic attacks that makes fun of someone, right? The humor is makes fun of oneself or makes fun with someone, but it's never um, a kind of aggression. So uh, when I say humor, I mean specifically humor and not any kind of comedic style. Uh, of course, there are comedic styles that doesn't work uh, and that will very quickly uh, actually reinforce conspiracy theory thinking. How much of humor do you think is at someone else's expense? So say you watch Seinfeld. They're quite brutal to each other, right? Even though they're friends. I don't think that's humor, by the way. What is it? Uh, well, um, it is, of course, comedic, right? Uh, it makes, uh, makes fun of people. But to me, humor is makes fun with someone or makes fun of oneself. What is the future of blockchain in Taiwan? Um, well, it would just keep growing, I guess. But used for what purposes? What's the killer app for blockchain 10 years from now? What will I be doing with it? What's the killer app for relational database again? Well, there are many kinds of relational databases. It's not clear that blockchain is the one emerging from markets as the preferred solution. Visa has databases, right? Those work well. It's a huge company. What's the competitor right. from blockchain? That, that's exactly right. So, so blockchain is just one implementation of a broad um, swath of technology known as distributed ledgers or DLTs. And relational databases, again, could be distributed. Uh, and um, if people want uh, easy accountability or auditability, they can use some of the um, technologies originated from blockchain. In, in that sense, Git is a blockchain because it's a chain of blocks. Uh, and of course, Git um, is the killer app of open source uh, decentralized working. And so, I mean, uh, if you think only of the cryptocurrency applications, uh, I don't think that it will overtake central bank anytime soon in Taiwan. I think it only is a value in the cryptocurrency uh, sense if the people have very low uh, trust in the fiat, right, in the central bank. Uh, but if you mean it like a ledger technology that keep people accountable and honest across jurisdictions among multiple riders for things like environmental science and things like smart contracts for labor, uh, like for migrant workers, as I mentioned on the very beginning, uh, those can see uh, useful work of distributed ledger technologies and blockchain is just one implementation detail. How do you think it mattered for Taiwan that democracy and information technology came to the country at more or less the same time? Well, uh, of course, that means that we see democracy as a set of technologies, social technologies. So to us, uh, technologies are not always industrial. It could also be social. Uh, the set of uh, constitutional amendments, uh, of which uh, another one or few is going on right now, um, shows that even the constitution, the kernel of democracy, uh, is technology that people can contribute to, just like sending pull requests to the Linux kernel. How did Taiwan become such a nice country so quickly? Um, well, maybe uh, the food is good and bubble tea helps too. What's the best food in Taiwan and where do you find it? Huh. Uh, well, uh, I think the rough consensus uh, is that uh, you can consult the Michelin Guide, uh, which operates in Taiwan uh, in a lot uh, of municipalities. But of course, being a oyster vegetarian, uh, the majority of which uh, is uh, I, I don't really pursue. Uh, so you have to uh, be your own guide. How do you think your politics have been influenced by Taiwan's aboriginal communities? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, the indigenous communities that I'm more familiar with is the Atayal uh, and the Amis. The former, uh, because I uh, spent quite a few months, uh, actually, if not year, uh, right after uh, dropping out of the middle school, uh, because my uh, mom uh, was co-founding an experimental primary school in the Atayal Mountains uh, in collaboration with the indigenous people there. So actually, the students there also learns the indigenous uh, perspective. And I, I really feel liberated uh, from a written culture uh, that this, this um, orally um, preserved uh, culture uh, really takes uh, 
me out of this um, human centric point of view uh, in a view that uh, the mountains and rivers are long lived spirits and we're just transient uh, stewards uh, that works with them. I think that really um, have influenced my politics a lot to be less human centric. Uh, the Amis, uh, because um, I think they're a matriarchy uh, and so quite useful to remind people that in Taiwan with more than 20 national languages, uh, there's various different uh, gender stereotypes going on. And and once you have 20 different kind of stereotypes, uh, it becomes a, a rainbow and it helps uh, people to break out of the binary kind of thinking when it comes to gender, but also to other categories. How useful a way is it of conceptualizing your politics to think of it as a, as a mix of some Taiwanese aboriginal traditions mixed in with Taoism, experience and programming, and then your own theory of humor and fun. And if mm -hmm. you put all of that together... The result is Audrey Tang's politics, correct or not? Well, um, as of now, of course, but of course, I'm also growing like a distributed legend. At the margin, what's the new influence on your thought in addition to those sources? Uh, I just read, again, uh, the Mandarin uh, translation of Ted Jiang's uh, novel uh, collection, uh, Exhalation. Uh, I already read the English one, uh, but the translation book just arrived, so I read that again. And so that's on the margins. Uh, I learned about the life cycle of software projects uh, and so on. Uh, I think that one is really good. What else from Chinese literature has influenced you? Um, of course, um, there's not only the Tao Te Ching, there's this whole uh, literary tradition um, that began with Lao Tzu, but John Tzu, of course, is of um, a lot of influence to me. Uh, the collection of poems, the Shi Jing also, uh, and of course, also the Yi Jing, uh, the original binary um, <laughs> uh, thinking. Uh, but of course, uh, the thing about the Book of Change is that uh, it t teaches about the only thing that is um immobile uh, that would not change uh, is change itself and how to work with the change to face to accept to deal with it and let go of it uh, i think is a core of a teaching of the Ching. and how about contemporary chinese fiction or is that somehow too anti-empathetic uh, i don't know again? i mean I enjoy I enjoy the three-body problem um trilogy uh that's contemporary chinese fiction isn't it from china from taiwanese culture what has influenced you most? So Taiwanese cinema from the 1990s, does, does that matter for you or that's orthogonal? Mm, well, of course, I, I, I watch um, the the uh, artworks uh, done by the um, Taiwanese um, renaissance uh, of filmmakers and, and books and so on. But I wouldn't say that any of them influenced me uh, to such a high degree uh, as the classics uh, has. So I'll probably have to say uh, that, of course, I'm influenced uh, one way or another, but not uh, in a major uh, part of my thought. And which Western anarchists, if any, have shaped your thought? Mm, well, that's a really good question, isn't it? Um, well, I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I've read, of course, the the anarchists FAQ, the anarchists um, like handbook uh, online, right? Uh, and also the Illuminatus trilogy, which may or may not count as anarchist. Uh, that, of course, um, has really led a, left an impression to me. But uh, no, I, I think the the main uh, source of inspiration I draw, of, uh, and that's why I call myself a conservative anarchist, is from the the more Eastern. Uh, traditions, the Taoist tradition, the Zhuangzi tradition, and more recently um, from uh, Ko Jin, uh, a, a Japanese uh, anarchist thinker. To what extent do you understand Taoism as standing in opposition to a more hierarchical Confucian view? Or do you think it's mm -hmm. simply a separate doctrine? By being mm -hmm. a Taoist, do you view yourself as opposed to Confucianism? Mm-hmm. Well, uh, the, da the Taoist isn't quite opposed to anything. That's, that's the thing with Taoist, right? Uh, we're, we're always uh, making space so that opposition can grow into common values and innovation. And I think that's something that the Confucian approach works too, except uh, for the Confucianism that is by coding, essentially, uh, the, the rights, right, the, um, the norms of uh, practice the best practices of norms and for a Taoist um, of course that there's no best practice there's just practices uh, and the best best practices maybe just to share and let go of your practices and be humble
How do you think Singapore differs in this regard? Is there a different understanding of Taoism there? More emphasis on Confucianism? I haven't been to Singapore. I can't answer that. Never? I'm surprised. No. Mm -hmm. Oh. What would improve Taiwanese education the most? Mm, that's an interesting thought, right? Well, maybe Neuralink, uh, but I, I don't know, right? In the meantime. Uh, uh, in the meantime, in the meantime, uh, well, I think that the shift uh, from a um, literacy uh, based like uh, standardized answer, wrote uh, memory, uh, standardized test, the teachers knows the best uh, into a competence based education, which is the people are producers of data and media and narratives that really helps. On the other hand, I'm biased because I'm part of the K-12 curriculum committee that put this into action starting last year. Do you have any sense how that's going? I know it's only a year, but mm -hmm. yeah, what I are think you seeing it, it, it's different. going quite well. Uh, the the cram schools, uh, for example, instead of putting people into like uh, long hours trying to memorize standardized answers, are now offering cram schools on hiking and uh, maybe kayaking uh, and all sort of outdoor group activities and also uh, help on the humanitarian aid overseas. Uh, even though travel is restricted now, we can still help through teleconference and so on. Um, and so, yeah, there's a lot more emphasis on social responsibility starting from a more tender age uh, rather than just individualistic uh, competition uh, between people and people. You're working, of course, in Taiwanese government. What's the biggest thing wrong with economists? Mm -hmm. uh, you mean the magazine? No, no, the people, economists, as thinkers. What's their biggest defect or flaw? I don't know. I, I, I haven't met an economist that I didn't like, so I don't think there's any particular personality flaws there. A few questions about the pandemic. How much of Taiwan's success do you think was due to government's openness, and how much do you think was due to the fact that in Taiwan, standards for privacy are different than in the West? And there's a certain acceptance of government. Are higher, control. I'm sure, yes. And, yeah. and more clearly spelled out. Uh, and um, so, first of all, I think, yeah, having a clearly spelled out uh, perimeter uh, in Taiwan when it comes to privacy and a strong uh, civil rights movement uh, that literally fought for those uh, freedoms and uh, memories are still fresh uh, really helps the conversation because anything that tried to encroach on the basic freedoms is immediately met uh, with the counter argument, do you want to go back to the martial law? Do you want to go back to the white terror? Uh, and of course, um, the argument would be a um, very strong. And so the people who advocate for less privacy would, um, that argument, their argument would be a non-starter. Uh, and so I, I think it really helps to uh, conserve the societal energy to work with the data that's already being collected, just use it in a way creatively to counter the pandemic instead of inventing new ways to collect data, uh, which always has uncertain privacy properties. So I think, of course, that helps. Now, my country, the United States, has made many, many mistakes at an almost metaphysical level. What is it in the United States that those mistakes have come from? What's our deeper failing behind all those mistakes? I don't know. I mean, uh, isn't America this grand experiment to keep making mistakes and correcting them in the open and share it with the world? That's the American experiment. Have we started correcting them yet? Uh, I'm sure that you have. Okay. I'm delighted to hear that. How much did Taiwan rely on privately written apps to combat the pandemic? Um, actually, uh, Civic Tech, which is, I guess, could also qualify as privately coded, um, is different in the sense that how it works is open for anyone who want to fork, that is to say, to take it to a different direction. So while it's true that the original mask availability map wasn't open source, uh, the API was open and open source uh, clones uh, and derivatives from the OpenStreetMap community, from various other community, very quickly sprouted and we have more than 140, a majority of which are open uh, innovations, and even the original mask availability map become open source uh, after a couple months. So if you keep working in the open, working out loud, even the most privately held corporations such as Google um, eventually agreed uh, to make uh, the parts of the uh, counter pandemic, the mass availability and so on, and develop them in the open. Given Taiwan's remarkable success with the pandemic, 
its amazing success with high-quality semiconductor chips? Why are there, in relative terms, so few successful Taiwanese software companies? And to what features of the Taiwanese psyche do you attribute that? I don't know. TSMC writes a lot of software. Uh, so I think uh, it's just consumer software, like uh, to see software. It's true. I mean, Taiwan has a... Um, Unicorn now, um, although I don't u usually use that word, uh, company uh, Appia uh, that uh, basically is entirely to be. Uh, they enable businesses to deliver insights from the interactions and uh, refactor their online experiences and so on. But I'm sure that uh, Pizza Hut or any company that deploy Appia technology would not uh, probably feature a uh, powered by Appia uh, kind of way uh, as the you know powered by Intel or or um, powered by uh, ARM uh, kind of um, marker uh, in their websites. Uh, and so there are very successful Taiwanese software companies. They are known in the software world. Trend Micro is another one. Uh, but uh, because these are less directly uh, to users, uh, to customers, um, and so maybe they're less well known. Uh, that That's a fact. Uh, and so the Taiwanese psych, uh, I think, is mostly about um, being okay with that, I guess. Uh, the hashtag like Taiwan can help, Taiwan is helping, uh, really says um, it on the tin that uh, we don't quite do this egoism. You don't have to thank Taiwan every 20 seconds if uh, our innovations have helped to you. We really just want the world to be better. Do you ever worry that Taiwan has had so much success against COVID-19 that now the country is painted into a kind of corner, unwilling to give up its grand prize, and it just won't be able to open to other places for a long time? Or do you think I'm sure that once managed. the vaccine once the vaccine is here around the turn of the year, uh, I'm sure that by Q1 next year, when people are vaccinated, it will open. Uh, that is what the scientists are saying. If you're recommending for a visitor an ideal trip to Taiwan, obviously they fly into Taipei. There's plenty to do and see in Taipei National Museum. But where else should they go for you? Mm, well, the Pescador, the Penghu Islands is great too. I mean, Taiwan is um, beautiful islands and it's plural. So it's not only the mainland <laughs> of Taiwan, uh, but also the Pescador Islands, the Orchid Islands. There's many other islands other than the main island of Taiwan for you to enjoy. What's your favorite Chinese dynasty and why? Um, I don't know. I don't have a favorite Chinese dynasty. Do you have a favorite GPS location? Uh, my home, but the Tang Dynasty, I thought would be your answer. There's the Silk I don't know. Road, I haven't right? lived Xi'an in the is the Tang capital. Dynasty. I haven't lived in the Tang Dynasty. I read about the Tang Dynasty. And uh, although my family name, I guess, is the same character as the Tang Dynasty, it never really brought me closer to any particular dynasties. As a Taiwanese, how do you think you understand earlier Chinese history in maybe a different way than Chinese mainlanders would? Well, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I identify mostly as Homo sapiens. Uh, and so I, I don't, I mean, we're all descendants of some um, East African common ancestor. Uh, and so when you say your home, I immediately think of Lucy, uh, which, well, strictly speaking, isn't Homo sapiens, but uh, the GPS um, location will be quite similar. Uh, so, so yeah, that's the view that, that I take. That uh, of course, uh, uh, on the land of the Eurasian plate, there's many uh, cultures and civilizations. Uh, whether you call it Chinese or not uh, is quite besides the point. Uh, the main interest for me is how those cultures uh, transfer uh, and learn from each other and make uh, cultural um, innovations such as Zen, which is a uh, transcultural conversation between the Buddhist tradition and the Taoist tradition. Uh, and, and that interests me more uh, than whether you call a particular dynasty Chinese or not. I mean, for the Qing dynasty and the Yuan dynasty, that's a, a very interesting way to call it a dynasty. I believe no Chinese person from the mainland would have given me that answer. Another historical question. When you read about the Taiping Rebellion, for whom are you rooting? The mm -hmm. rebels or the government? Uh huh. Well, um, yeah, the, the Taiping Rebellion, the, the Jesus uh, worshipping uh, revolution. But there's a millenarian sense to it that's a bit like some of tech utopianism, right? 
that the well, world should I mean, become there, an there open was place. A, there was a document. Uh, I think it was typing Yao Shu or something uh, that has a lot of tech uh, utopianism in it. But uh, I don't think it's ever put into practice. So uh, if you view it from a kind of uh, admiring a science fiction novel kind of way, uh, I think you can definitely root for it. But I don't think the Taiping Tianguo actually deployed uh, what's described in the Taiping Yao Shu to any significant degree. Which are the most important remnants of Japanese influence remaining in Taiwan? Mm -hmm. Well, um, the emphasis on public health, <laughs> the, the fact that uh, people see that uh, working in the medical and public health professions is the high and noble cause of calling. Um, I think that um, was introduced by the Japanese colonial rule uh, and it's well, of course, there's a political part of it because the Japanese really didn't like Taiwanese uh, going into politics uh, or law for that matter. Uh, and but yeah, the emphasis on um, public health and on medicine and Medicare, I think that really is one of the legacies. The organization of streets and shops in Taiwan, especially Taipei, feels quite Japanese to me. Do you have the same impression? Uh, there are parts of Taipei that feels quite Japanese, of course. Um, the the uh, cabinet office, the executive yuan, uh, and the presidential office were both um, buildings of that era. Of course, they were also uh, learning from European uh, architects, so it's also very transcultural. In both Japan and Taiwan, baseball is fairly popular, as it is in the United States, but most countries reject baseball altogether. Do you have a sense of why Taiwanese have welcomed baseball? Is it just mm -hmm. historical accident? or revealing of something deeper? Mm -hmm. I haven't considered that question, maybe because when I was young, I couldn't participate in any kind of sport, baseball included. Uh, and so I've never thought much about sports. Uh, Esport, of course, I've thought about quite a bit. But uh, of course, we're not here to talk about Match the Gathering, which I can talk for hours. What's the most popular esport in Taiwan? Um, well, that's a really good question. Um, I think by the current definition of eSport, uh, it will probably uh, be, be Wei Qi, uh, the, the uh, Go, um, which is a intellectual game um, that's played on stones uh, and large boards, and of which AlphaGo, of course, um, <laughs> um, showed that um, uh, machines can play it too. Uh, but it's still very popular in Taiwan, as with uh, Gomoku, or also known as Renju, uh, and Xiangxi, um, the um, the, the elephant chess. Uh, I don't know how to translate that actually. Uh, so various board games and these shogi, are, are, right? are. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, but yes. well, shogi is a, a slightly different rule uh, and uh, play in Japan. But yeah, board games that are um, turn based and uh, moved, uh, of course, nowadays all into the electronic realm uh, remain the, of the lowest uh, threshold to join and therefore very popular. And what's your favorite esport? Um, as I mentioned, uh, Magic the Gathering, but I don't play it much anymore. I used to play a lot. Because of addiction. So it's like the touchscreen smartphone. No, uh, because of, uh, I was making the software that enabled people to play Magic the Gathering without paying Wizard of the Coast. <laughs> uh, and so it was a, a real software project that I was uh, working on, the Magic Suitcase, uh, and also working with the, the apprentice with the drafting um, uh, mechanism so that people don't have to be locked in uh, to Wizard of the Coast and so on. So uh, to me, it also feels liberating, I guess, uh, so that people, even with no... Um, uh, money and uh, who are living uh, very modest means and so on can, can enjoy uh, the game and essentially creating their own rules. Why is it you think that Taiwan has been so much more open and accepting of LGBTQ than most or maybe all other parts of Asia? Well, first of all, I think uh, that's because, as I mentioned, there's more than one norm going on, right? Even in the ethnic Han, uh, there is the Taiwanese Holo, Taiwanese Hakka, uh, and many traditions, uh, some of which uh, is actually quite natural to uh, have, um, I think... Um, I, I don't know how to translate that, that term, uh, like a, a contractual union um, brother, uh, whatever that means, uh, and in the Taiwanese whole tradition. Uh, and there's also the indigenous nations, um, and with, for example, the Paiwan nation that doesn't quite make a distinction between genders when um, electing their uh, leaders uh, of the uh, indigenous nation and so on. Uh, and so because of the transculturalism uh, in Taiwan and uh, open and democratic 
Arabic uh, culture, uh, we eventually see that uh, even though there is a part of the country, maybe the majority at some point, that sees marriage as uh, between families and the individual that wed are just representatives of their families, uh, eventually other more individual to individual norms prevail and in 2008 become uh, the only form of recognized marriage, which is by registration. And that in, in addition to the feminist movement that fought for the equal rights uh, for women to not having to, you know, uh, relinquish her family name when they uh, marry and things like that, um, all uh, led to the feeling of intersectionality so that the earliest uh, feminist activist would then uh, be the most uh, ardent allies to the LGBTIQ plus community. Um, so I think early successes and also the way to uh, work themselves into the gender equality com committee and 12 years of gender mainstreaming work, the gender impact assessment in the public sector and so on, all of these mechanism designs help to make a more uh, liberal uh, culture out of the existing culture, a family to family relationship, which we did not actually um, disrupt uh, with the marriage equality law. It only hyperlinks to the individual parts, the bylaws, but not the in-law relationships, the family between family relationships. For our final segment of this conversation, I'll turn to what I call the Audrey Chang production function. At ages five to six, you read a lot of classical literature. Uh, mm -hmm. What did you read and how did it shape you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I read the, the Shi Jing, the collection of poems, uh, and it shaped me uh, to view things always from uh, coaches, from various different coaches, because uh, each chapter in the Shi Jing is literally one slice of culture, of a very different culture, and it's a kind of collection of poems that shows how the same thing may be interpreted and narrated in completely different ways from two uh, different cultures when they view the same historical event, and of course the Dao De uh, that showed me um, that we are um, merely spaces uh, of which that uh, thoughts may pass through us, but we don't own the thoughts. The thoughts own us briefly. How did having a heart problem until age 12 shape your life? Uh, well, I guess it made me less interested in outdoor sports. Uh, it also made me less uh, prone to anger or really any passion, right? I can't feel uh, very joyful either uh, because of um, the heart condition. So I'm more calm and collected. I uh, learned that was breathing exercises uh, and they're with me like a survival instinct um, still now. Do you think there's any cognitive disadvantage to being more objective and arguably more detached? I'm not sure that I'm currently detached to you, uh, and I'm not sure that I'm sharing things from an objective uh, point of view. I mean, I'm sharing my feelings and personal memories when I was a young child, and these are only verifiable as phenomena uh, in my own um, mind. Uh, and so I, I'm not sure that the term objective is the right term to use here. What was your family discussion table like? Um, it was were very lively, uh, and because um, both my parents were journalists that works um, with the political and law training, uh, and so uh, democratization is on the forefront of their minds, uh, and also because they were censored uh, by the uh, single party a lot at the time, uh, and so I would read their drafts, and the drafts being censored, uh, and they will uh, debate the censor, uh, taking the um, case uh, to the owner of the press if needed be. Uh, um, and for environmental justice and social justice and so on. Uh, and so a lot of discussion was around um, censorship and the freedom of press when I was really young. Are there cognitive advantages to being transgender? Well, uh, of course, uh, I think it makes it easier to empathize with people, right? Because I've gone through some parts of your puberty, no matter the uh, gender of you. Uh, and so I wouldn't feel that half a population is different from me. I would feel that I'm just part of homo sapiens. This is a large community. Do you think there are cognitive disadvantages of being transgender? Um, no, uh, I think people can be more transgender. I mean, um, when our minister, Chen Shizhong, the commander of the Central Epidemic Command Center, put on the medical mask to show solidarity uh, to the young boy uh, who called to say that he doesn't want to go to school because pink masks being rationed uh, makes him look like he'll be bullied. Um, I think uh, Minister Chen and the medical officers became a little bit more transgender on that very moment. And so it's a practice like translation and transculturalism. 
What's the biggest misconception about transgender life and existence amongst intelligent, educated people? I, I have no idea. I have not done a qualitative survey. Now, you didn't go through the cycle of being educated in the United States the way many Taiwanese do. Uh, do you think that's given you a different perspective? I don't know. I mean, I mean, the IETF and uh, the Internet itself maybe is really the, the American experiments value, the United States value, the value of the United States uh, written uh, in a like 70, 80 uh, kind of view uh, in, in code. Uh, and so by working with Internet technologies, by working with the implicit assumption of freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, and the press, end-to-end uh, -end, um, innovation and permissionless innovation um, and things like that, I think... Um, I'm more uh, imbued uh, in the internet, seeing more imbued American value in the internet than a traditional education in the States uh, would, uh, I, I think. Now, of course, nowadays the internet governance uh, is multicultural and there's multicultural internet domain names, uh, but we're still using ASCII, which is um, the A in ASCII, um, it's American, uh, and the um, idea that uh, the M the American values imbued in the internet are somehow universal, of course, are now being challenged, but it's not lost. I think the core internet is still very much the values that unite the states. Now, in 2014, you were part of a group of activists that occupied Taiwan's parliament building. What was mm -hmm. your thinking behind participation in that activity? What were you hoping to accomplish? What did you see as the trade-offs? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I've read uh, and actually translated uh, Manuel Castells uh, in the um, ideas uh, in the books uh, Network of uh, Outrage and Hope and Earlier in Communication Powers. Uh, and so we have the benefit, I guess, from learning from previous occupiers, such as the Occupy Wall Street, of course, but also the 15M and other movements. And so um, I started understanding that the more that you can make humor uh, travel faster than rumor, uh, the more you can get people interested in a kind of night market uh, fun-ish kind of way, uh, the less likely uh, that the more divisive and the more revenge-seeking part of a Occupy movement will grow. That is to say, the conservative part in anarchism uh, has a chance to thrive and people have a chance to um, arrive to rough consensus and running care Code, legal code uh, in this case, uh, when they can literally hum uh, in the street. And so uh, my, my main uh, work there is just with a bunch of uh, people in the Gov Zero community to set up communication infrastructure so that people can understand uh, what's really going on uh, with their own eyes and participating in the journalism making uh, without being derailed by the rumors and uh, uh, disinformation campaigns that's bound to come with any Occupy. How important is the skill of translation for becoming a better thinker? Um, I think it's very, very important, but so also important is the skills of rotation and scaling. Were you afraid that working in government would ruin or corrupt you? No, not at all. I'm working with the government. I'm not working for the government. What are your skills of rotation and scaling, and how do you use them in the government? Mm -hmm. Yeah, scaling means that taking something that used to only happen between two people or three people uh, that's uh, listening intently and scaling it uh, using technology to make sure that when I tour around Taiwan, I can still listen intently uh, to people who are social innovators in their indigenous nation or their remote island or rural areas, but at the same time um, through the um, modern technology, uh, which seems like magic at times. Uh, people from five municipalities, from 12 central uh, government ministries can also listen as intently uh, as I am uh, to the stories uh, and the innovations of the local people. Uh, and so that uh, scales the listening um, idea. And by rotation, I mean taking all the sides. So uh, whenever there are people of differing positions on an emerging topic, it could be Uber, it could be eSports, it could be 5G, self-drive vehicles, you name it. Um, if I find that I cannot uh, argue from any particular viewpoint, I will uh, book a couple of days to spend time with the community on ethnographic 
just hanging out uh, and until I rotate my worldview and until I can argue from their uh, viewpoint. And so that's called taking all the sides. Why aren't there more Audrey Tangs in the other governments of the world? I don't know. Uh, I mean, that's a question for the other government. Uh, maybe uh, I think um, people were limited by the imagination of the government uh, being a single thing, right? Uh, we said internet governance. We didn't say internet government. Uh, if the IETF or ICANN started calling themselves internet government, I'm sure that the, there's will be a lot of more limitation in thinking in the multi-stakeholder approach. But no, we, we call it governance. We don't call it government. So maybe just the word government itself limits people's imaginations. And if rotation is fundamental to your thought, it seems that most governments in the literal sense of that term are not always so interested in rotation, right? They want to push through a particular set of policies to serve interest groups and constituencies toward the end of being reelected. Uh, well, but election is a kind of rotation. It's just temporal, right? It rotates a little bit every four years. Sure, but any particular government uh, is not interested in rotation per se. In fact, they would prefer its opposite over time. Yeah, but I'm talking about democratic cultures and democratic norms. So if we shorten the iteration to not four years, but actually maybe 60 days, uh, as is the standard uh, iteration in Taiwanese Citizens Initiative, the, the e-petition platform, um, then we can iterate more. Uh, each particular generation, of course, in that 60 days are interested from their point of view. But if you rotate quickly, uh, then uh, even a, a still pictures when rotated quickly uh, uh, looks like animation. Uh, actually, that's where the word animate came from. It's just quickly animated frames. And if you think about your own life and career over the next few years, if you wish to increase your own empathy at the margin, uh, what do you feel that calls for from you? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think uh, a couple more things, right? I need to learn more languages. Uh, and now with the help of uh, assistive intelligence, such as machine learning and translation, it's becoming much easier. Uh, I uh, take a step doing that, translating how to use the... Um, traditional rice cooker that you see right there to disinfect the mask so that it kills the virus but doesn't destroy the PP material. Uh, I translated it and uh, narrated it uh, in, I think, a dozen languages. Um, and so it's, it's a beginning, uh, but I look forward to learn more languages and communicate uh, in more languages. Uh, and the other thing is also um, synthesize, right? Uh, more of the uh, cultures that I have come across uh, into a more transcultural um, way of living, a uh, transcultural way of thinking, uh, and that includes up to the name of the country itself, uh, Taiwan. The name of the country is officially Zhonghua Mingguo, which I translate as a transcultural republic of citizens. And and now that's a, uh, I wouldn't say universal, but at least a world globally applicable view. Anyone can be part of the transcultural republic of citizens. And which languages do you know now already? Um, JavaScript, pretty well. Um, yes. Well, uh, Pro, uh, Raku, <laughs> Haskell, uh, and uh, Python, not very fluently, Ruby, of course, uh, and so on. Uh, there's but English, uh, right? C, C++, C Sharp, uh, not really C Sharp, uh, OCaml, uh, and also C. Uh, anyway, yes, um, sorry, uh, OCaml is F Sharp. Uh, yeah, English, of course. Uh, Chinese? But I think, I think Native Taiwanese? In, yeah, I think in English uh, mostly nowadays, if you talk about natural language. And uh, for me, um, Mandarin, or uh, along with Mandarin, Taiwanese, Holoc, which are my two native languages, uh, I reserve them uh, for more poetic uh, expressions, but my work language is not definitely English. Audrey Tang, thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure.